together with us? How many know Jesus is alive? Amen. Amen. Come on and praise the Lord this morning. Are you glad that he got up? Are you glad that Jesus is risen? That he's alive and alive forevermore. It's the promise sealed for me and you that beyond this life, there is something else. Come on, somebody. If you are thankful today that you are on your way to heaven. Hallelujah. We're thankful today that we have the promise of life after this, that eternal life is for us. And this morning, if you're in the room today and you don't know him and you don't know that, today is the greatest opportunity for you to access what he is alive for so that you can spend eternity with the Father in heaven, being reconciled to him through Jesus. We are thankful today. We, we commemorated his death on Friday. Today, we are celebrating a risen Savior, Jesus. You can be seated this morning for just a moment. We want to say thank you for being here and especially to some very special folks in the room today. All of our first time guests and families, Kannapolis, can we welcome those who are with us for the very first time on this Easter Sunday. And if this is your family's first time with us, we want to invite you to take out your cell phone real quick and text the word welcome to the number that's on the screen. When you do that, that, that helps us to connect with you and walk you through a process as you learn more about who the Kannapolis Church of God is and how you can plug into that.
And so we want to invite you again to text the word welcome to that number, 704-368-0848 that's on the screen there. Just take just a moment to do that. And while you're doing that, we are going to continue in our service to a time of giving. And our ushers are preparing now to serve you this morning. We open up our time of worship every single week with our time of giving of our tithe and of our offering. Here at Kannapolis, we view giving as an act of worship. Amen, someone. We, we believe that worship is giving unto the Lord. It's not this consumeristic thing where we're taking, 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 but he has given so much to us that we take just a moment on each week to give back to him uh, of, of our tithe and our offering as we go into a time of worship, as we give of ourselves even deeper than that. Can I tell you that money is the most shallow thing you can give to God? Well... <laughs> Pastor said, we still want you to give, though. <laughs> but, but can I tell you that worship, your affection, your desire for him is the greatest thing that we can give. And we open this time of giving with tithe and offering to symbolize God. There is nothing that we are holding so tightly to that it's more important than who you are to us. Amen. Let's pray over the offering. We're going to continue in worship. Father, we thank you today for, again, who you are and all that you have done we thank you today that uh, your son Jesus not only died on a cross, but he rose from a grave. And we're thankful today, God, that as we give, God, let this be uh, the introduction to our worship to you today. Father, I pray that we would live open-handed, knowing, God, that everything that we have belongs to you. And Lord, we pray that you would bless this time as we go into the remainder of this service. Lord, that you would heal hearts, deliver hearts today, God. We pray that today, if one does not know you, God, that today they would come to know you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Just praise the Lord. Come on, give him praise today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. That's the way to start Easter off, right? With a praise for the victorious Jesus. Amen. And while you're standing, it's great to see all of you. I see a lot of new faces. I see a lot of returning faces. I see a lot of faces I see every week. But regardless, you're welcome here, and we've come to worship the Lord today and lift him up. And sometimes it helps to get to know a few people around you that are doing the same thing you are. So I want you to take that moment right now. Why don't you shake a few hands and greet a few people, introduce yourself, welcome them here for Resurrection Sunday at KCOG, Kannapolis Church of God. Let them know you're glad to see them here. We welcome each other today. Amen.
you to understand something today. We're here to celebrate the risen Jesus. Amen? Amen? But that's only part of the story because the other part of this story is that he has called you to rise to new life in him. And so the resurrection is not just a story of the past, but it's a story of our present because God has called out to us to come to new life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I want to ask someone, if you are excited about not only the resurrected Jesus of the past, but the resurrected Christ in you today in new life, would you just say yes, amen? amen? It's a glorious day, amen. Come on, will you put your hands together with me? I was buried in my shame.
right where you stand, will you just lift up holy hands to him and just say, thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. God, help us to see this morning as much more than dressing up or a special holiday. It's eternal significance. Jesus has risen and he's calling us today, every person in this place, to live with him. Lord, your word said that he is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father, ever interceding for you and me. You know what that means today? That not only did Jesus rise again, but he's praying right now for you and asking God on your behalf for your eternal life. How many have received that gift this morning? Friends, if you're here and you haven't, you're going to have an opportunity a little later. I'm not trying to preach. I'm just setting Pastor up because he's going to ask you, I promise. Before you leave this place, he's going to ask you, are you ready to rise with Jesus again? Pastor, I'll tell you now, my answer is yes. I can't wait to rise again with him. We already know that the story in Revelation says, for he shall, they were, I saw him on a white horse with fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand his vesture dipped in the blood that said upon him is king of kings and lord of lords how many know that's the risen Jesus we know of today hallelujah hallelujah praise the lord we're going to sing some hymns here I want you to just let's celebrate this together with me
Amen, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Give him all you've got today. He's worthy of everything that we have and then some. I think we can sing that one more time, that praise God part. Praise God. Praise God. your hands. Just honor his presence here today. I felt him from the moment we began all through the service today. I know he's here. He cares about where you are and what's going on in your life. And I believe this word today is going to touch your heart if you'll listen and receive what God has for you. Thank you so much for being here today. You can be seated if you like. My goodness, I, I was running my little short legs off earlier, trying to get around to as many people as I could old friends, new friends, people I've met before, people I haven't, and I didn't get around to everybody, and I apologize for that. I'll try to see you after church. If this is your first time or your first time in a really long time, we hope to see you right after church back in that room with the glass windows right there. I want to just visit for a minute. We're not going to ask you for money. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to yell at you. We're just going to love on you. We'd love to see you after church if this is your first time or your first time in a long time. We love having people come to the Kannapolis Church of God, and we want to let you know so. Wow, what a wonderful day so far. Has anybody felt the presence of the Lord besides me? I've felt his presence. I really have. Today, we culminate what many people call Holy Week. We come together to celebrate the last great act of the Lord connected with his passion. Some would say it's the ascension, but I, I think that today is the day we celebrate the greatest act of Jesus Christ that he ever performed in his entire life, and that was that he rose from the dead. He didn't stay in the grave. It, it, some people say it would have been enough. I don't agree with this, but some people say it would have been enough for Jesus just to die. If he had just died, that would have been enough. He would have paid the price for our sins. But the thing is, he said, if you die with me, you'll also rise with me. So the resurrection is showing that not only did he pay for our sins, but he won the victory over death. Now, we, we hear a lot of people preach, and they talk about, he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. It's really only the first two, death and hell. But I just like to think of how it might have looked to Satan as Jesus stood there with the keys. I, I, I don't know. I, I remember when I got my first car keys, I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. When I got a house key. And I could come in. I had a curfew. I didn't have to knock on the door like some stranger. I could just walk in the house at night. Here's Satan. He thought he had the keys for maybe 5,000 years from the inception of the earth until the time that Jesus died on the cross. He thought he had the keys. He was called the prince of the power of the air. He was the ruler of darkness, if you will. He had one-third of all the angels in heaven believe his lies, and they fell out of the heavens and walked with him on earth. That's where demons came from, angels that made a choice not to serve the one true God but to follow after Lucifer. And for thousands of years, we think about 5,000 years, from the time of creation till the time of Christ's death, Satan had the keys. He thought he was in charge. And in many ways, he was. Sin came into the earth in the Garden of Eden, 
and Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that they were not supposed to eat of, and they brought sin into the world. Death came into the world. Sickness came into the world. Lifespan came into the world. But in one moment, I don't think Jesus fought with Satan for three days. No way. He didn't fight with him for three days. He didn't have a WWE wrestling match for three days. He didn't have a boxing match like he was fighting Mike Tyson. I believe that the moment he showed up in the belly of the earth, that Jesus said, give me back what's mine. I don't even know if there was a fight. I think Satan just had to say, yes, sir, Lord, here they are. And he won back the keys to death and hell. And with those keys, he opened up the graves for people who had been in there for maybe years, decades, centuries. And some of them walked out of that belly of the earth with him. Just kind of as a preview of the rapture. Wow. What a great day that was when Jesus rose from the dead. I want to I go back in time from that just a little bit. I don't want to stay on the crucifixion, but I want to talk about the, the, the science, if you will, of the resurrection, the science of the crucifixion. Uh, I, I read an article earlier this week by a PhD named Colleen Schreier. She's from Azusa Pacific University, which is a primarily Christian university. And she, every year, produced a, a lecture that she would give students on the science of the crucifixion. Amazing stuff. Really amazing stuff. She's got a, a Ph.D. in chemistry and a Ph.D. in biology, and she knows all the science of it. I'm not going to bore you with all the science of it, but I want to just set the stage with this. You see, it's important to understand from the very beginning of the story of the Passion of the Christ that Jesus would have been in excellent physical condition. For one thing... I don't think they had cornbread or cat head biscuits back in the days of Jesus. They didn't have big Texas cinnamon rolls. So a lot of what he ate was that Mediterranean diet, a lot of vegetables, a lot of lean meats, a lot of a sheep and lamb meat, some beef perhaps. He didn't eat pork, so he didn't have to worry about cholesterol or high blood pressure. He was a carpenter. He was a man who worked with his hands. And everywhere they went back then, they walked. They walked. They didn't have cars. They didn't even have motorcycles. They didn't have mopeds. They didn't have any of that. They didn't even have bicycles. They walked almost everywhere they went. He would have been in unbelievable physical condition. And to think of the fact that what they did to him, eventually he succumbed to his injuries. It was a torturous and a maddening process that he went through before his death. Let's talk about the stress of the passion of Christ for just a moment. Luke 24, verses 41 to 44, it says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The medical condition is hematohydrosis. His capillaries began to break down. The blood from those vessels mixed with his sweat in his pores, and the body began to sweat great drops of blood. His skin was made tender by this particular phenomenon that happened in his body and his his disciples would have most likely been able to notice that his face was already bloody when he came back to them in the garden before the soldiers came to take him away it results from mental anguish or agony high high levels of stress where his blood pressure would have raised to the point that the capillaries in his face and around his body were weakened by the pressure and then they began to seep blood into the very sweat glands that's stress beyond anything I've ever experienced I've had headaches before from stress. I've had situations happen to where I felt like I, I was maybe lightheaded, but I've never had blood come out of the pores of my skin. Jesus suffered that type of anguish and stress and agony. 
I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a point here. We're going to look at the things that happened to Jesus because we need to understand that because of all that happened to Jesus, he literally, absolutely, unequivocally died on that Friday afternoon. There are people that propose different theories for how Jesus could have risen again. One of them that I think is absolutely silly is called the swoon theory. It says that Jesus just passed out from all the pain and a few days later woke up in the grave and the disciples came and rolled the stone away so he could get out and they nursed his wounds and brought him back to health so that he could meet with everybody in the upper room and walk with people on the road to Emmaus. But the beating that he took, there is no way in God's green earth that in just a few short days he could have come out of that grave and walked among the people and had conversations and ate with them had he been beaten, bloodied, and crucified to the degree that he was. To be honest, most scientists agree that Jesus could not have lived through what he went through. He could not have. Matthew talks about the beating. He released Barabbas to them, that's Pilate, and he scourged Jesus and delivered him to be crucified. Same thing is said in basically Mark 15, 15. You see, Pilate orders Jesus to be flogged as required by Roman law before crucifixion. Normally, every prisoner would stand at a pole with their hands tied, completely naked, humiliated. And it was not a private affair. Anyone could come and watch if they so desired. And then they were flogged, covering the area from their shoulders down to their upper legs. The whip consisted of strips of leather. And in the middle of the strips were metal balls somehow fused in there that when they beat the person, that bruises would immediately uh, well up in their body. Their skin would be weakened. But then there were also shards of sheep bone that were placed at the end of the those straps, and when they would strike the person being beaten, it would cut their skin into ribbons, and then it would dig into the muscle, and when they pulled back, it would pull chunks of meat out of his bag. This was not a pretty sight. It created mincemeat. It created, it created just an a, a, a unrecognizable system of skin and muscles on his back, and he began to lose blood, copious amounts of blood. He, he lost so much blood that most people would probably not have been able to continue in their journey to the cross. That's how bad it was. Jesus' expression of thirst was a natural physical reaction to dehydration. He lost several pints of blood from the beating. And when blood volume loss is over 40%, blood pressure becomes very low. Heart and breathing rates are very high. And a person's mental status becomes confused, irritable, and possibly they pass out or become unconscious. In that type of situation, oftentimes the tongue will swell. Therefore, at times when Jesus spoke, they misunderstood his words and thought he was saying one thing when actually he was saying another. When he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, they thought that he was calling for the prophet Elijah because his mental state was probably slightly uh, altered and his tongue was swollen to the point that they did not know what he was saying. The disciples knew The ones who recorded the scriptures knew, but the soldiers and the other people thought he was calling for Elijah. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, and I've seen these thorns in Israel, I've stood in the spot where they say Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and people come there to worship all the time. There are, there are olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane that are uh, venerated to be over 2,000 years old. Guess what? That means they were standing when Jesus came and prayed in that garden. It's a holy place. Jesus didn't stay there. He went on to the trial. They put together a crown of thorns. And these thorns, I've seen them in their natural habitat. They can be two to three inches long and extremely pointed on the end. I wanted to try to harvest some to bring back with me, but they said you need to be careful because the chemical that is in the tip of that thorn will cause a stinging sensation in your skin should you accidentally stick yourself with one of them. And that 
is what was shoved down upon the head of Jesus Christ and no doubt dug into his skin. And then they began to beat him and hit him in the face and spit on him so that the thorns dug deeper and deeper into his brow and he lost more and more blood. They mocked him. They said, Hail, King of the Jews. They put a robe on his back and a reed in his hand and forced him to stand while they mockingly bowed before him. That, that robe that was on his back, the blood probably uh, clotted, it coagulated onto the uh, garment. And then later they pulled the garment off his back and all of the bleeding that had been stopped by the clotting was ripped open again. I'm not trying to gross you out today. I'm not trying to make you sad. That's not what today is for. And we're going to get past this in just a moment. Those thorns sticking in his skin most likely irritated and stabbed into the nerve system in his forehead. And he had excruciating pain on top of the pain from his back and his upper legs. He was then forced to carry the cross beam. A lot of times we see movies where he's carrying an entire cross, but actually they just had the cross beam tied to their arms and they had to carry the cross beam to the cross where they would be uh, crucified. But even that was too much. It fell under the weight of it. He was weak. He was dehydrated. He was unable to carry that cross beam. They called for a man, Simon of Cyrene, and he carried it to Golgotha, the place of the skull. There are people that like to say that the place of Jesus' crucifixion was in the Jerusalem proper, the old city of Jerusalem proper, but I've stood where there is the face of a skull, and they call the place Golgotha, and I see up on the hill where Jesus would have been crucified and he would have been a spectacle for all the world to notice up there. And it just happens to be a few steps away from the garden tomb where they feel as though Jesus may have been laid to rest after he died. As he was placed on the cross, they divided his garments and they cast lots. And as he was crucified... You see these spikes that are in this replica cross. Right here. Seven, eight, nine inches long. Like a railroad spike this one is. But they were similar even in the days of Christ. And as they hung him, they put that spike through the radius and the ulna in his arm and hit that medial nerve, which caused tremendous pain. And hung him on that cross. When they put his feet against the post below, it had to be like this in order to drive the nail through the top of his foot. So he was hanging like this. Not like we see him so beautifully on the medieval paintings. But he hung with his legs bent and to push up to get a little room for his diaphragm to work and for him to be able to breathe caused excruciating pain in his feet. It was a horrible, horrible state that Jesus found himself in. When he died, he cried out with a loud voice. He yielded up his spirit. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He breathed his last. As we heard Friday night, Jesus received the sour wine and he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Why would he say, Father, I commend my spirit into your hands? Why would he say it is finished? Why would he say any of that? Why would he breathe his last? How would it be so obvious that he had breathed his last were it not visibly clear that Jesus in that moment, the man Jesus Christ, died? They were so sure of it that when they came by, they didn't break his legs like they did the other two. See, they would break their legs so they couldn't push up and get breath. But Jesus had already stopped breathing. He was obviously dead. Instead, just to make sure, they took a spear. I don't have a spear. I would try to demonstrate. They took a spear, a long spear, a javelin, and they shoved it up into his side. And because of the physical conditions that he had to endure, there are many that believe he had a myocardial infarction, that he had a heart attack. Maybe his heart burst. But anyway, it would explain how when they stabbed him in the side, that blood and water flowed out. 
because the blood from the heart was mixed with the plural liquid that was in the sack, and when it was punctured, it would bring out blood and water. Some of you are probably saying, I didn't come here today to get a medical lesson. I didn't come here today to be grossed out. But I want you to understand something. Our Savior did not fake his death. Our Savior did not just suffer like a hologram. They called it the docetic view in the, in, in the philosophical and theological ranks, the docetic view. He was just a hologram. He wasn't really flesh and blood. He didn't have to feel anything. No, it says we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are. He went through everything we went through. He felt the pain. He experienced temptations from the devil. He understood our frame. He understood it intellectually before he walked on the face of the earth. I think he probably understood it more than we think. But for our sake, he came and walked in flesh and blood on the face of the earth so that he might show us that he experienced what we experienced. We can't look at God and say, you don't understand, because he does. He went through it all. He even died so that he could identify with us. He died. Look at the reaction of the crowd. The centurion saw what had happened. He glorified God. Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together that to to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and went away. They returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. In Matthew 27, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God, the very people that had mocked him moments earlier, now realized that they were in the presence of the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. He was called a righteous man. The crowd reacted, beat their breasts. There was even natural phenomena or unnatural phenomena, if you want to call it that. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It was too high for a person to reach the top. Nobody could start at the bottom and just tear it open and say it happened. Starting from the top, it was too high for a man to reach. The hand of God was the only one that could come and take the top of the veil and rend it from top to bottom as if to say, my son that died on that cross has now made a way for you to no longer have to send the priest in to ask for forgiveness of your sins, but now you can walk into the throne room yourself. Give him praise the best you can. He is worthy. He won the right for us to go to the throne room and be forgiven. We can go to the Holy of Holies because of what he did. And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That's not natural. I'm calling it natural phenomena. Let's call it unnatural phenomena. That earthquakes and rocks split, graves were open, and bodies were raised from the dead and came into the city to say hello. Let me tell you a little bit about the process of embalming and how they how they handled bodies back in the days of Christ. They would wrap them in spices and and oils and herbs to preserve them, to keep them from decaying so quickly. But eventually, everybody would eventually decay, decay until the point that there was nothing left but bones. And then they would take their bones and, and they came apart. They would take their bones and put them in a little box about this big. I can't remember what they called them. Do you remember, Cody, what they call those small boxes? Estuaries. That's it. Estuaries. And they would put them in the estuaries, and then they would be put somewhere else, and their bones would fit into a box this big and about this tall. How does that guy walk out of a grave? It's only by the resurrection power of an almighty God 
I'm talking about the miracle of the resurrection here today. Things happen with Jesus' death and his resurrection that had never happened before and have not happened since and will not happen again until that day. I loved hearing these trumpets over here, but I'm telling you, there's going to be a better trumpet one day that's going to sound the voice of the archangel, the call of God, and we'll all come out of the graves and be risen again together with him forevermore. Jesus' death and life was different than any other that had ever happened. Let's talk about the resurrection for just a minute. Mark 28, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. (laughs) For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I don't know exactly what the chronology of these events would be. Two other gospels talk about how they came to the tomb and they already saw the stone rolled back and the angel sitting on the stone and one of them, two angels in one of the gospels were recorded. But I think that probably just before the women came to the tomb, there's all these real burly, big Roman guards. Oh, yeah, they got their metal uh, chest plates on. They've got their little frilly stuff coming down. I call it their skirt. Maybe a, maybe a Roman-era kilt. I don't know what it was. They had that. They showed off the muscles in their leg. They had big muscles in their bodies probably. They were tough and they were mean. Who knows, maybe that one of the guys that beat Jesus might have had to be uh, assigned to to guard the tomb. Wouldn't that have just been poetic justice? And they're standing there. They're probably a little bit sleepy. It's, it's coming close to daybreak. And all of a sudden, they see a light. They see an unbelievable light. And all of a sudden, they realize that there's a presence with them. They kind of wipe the sleep out of their eyes, and they look up, and they see this angelic form I imagine those Roman guards were big guys, but I imagine that the angel made them feel like children. His size, his majesty, his strength, he had to move that stone. Now, I've seen the stone that they say would have been in front of the tomb, and it's, it's, it's cut off to where it's about this thick and it runs on a track, but I would guarantee you it still weighs a couple of hundred pounds. It is a thick piece of rock. It's big around. It's almost five feet tall, and, and nobody could move. Those women couldn't move it. As a matter of fact, in some of the Gospels, they ask one another, who's going to move the stone for us? You know what? I think Jesus, I mean, God may have just heard them ask that question and say, don't worry, girls. I got it covered. (laughs) I got it covered. I got it covered. And that angel came and began to move that stone. Maybe one of them had just enough strength of character in himself. He might have looked at the angel and said, hey, 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 wait a minute. What are you doing? You can't do that. And I imagine that the angel just went. And I noticed that when the women got to the tomb just a few minutes later, there were no more Roman guards. They ran back to their barracks and told their captain. And then the captain had to tell the lieutenant. And the lieutenant had to tell somebody else. And eventually they had to go back to the Pharisees. Listen, I know you paid us to guard that tomb. But the guy said something freaky happened out there. And an angel came and he rolled the stone back. I don't know what we're going to do. And the Jews paid them and said, tell no one what you saw. Could they have possibly used the 30 pieces of silver that Judas, no, they bought a field with that, but they gave them money to lie and to say that the disciples came and stole him away. I don't know about you. I know there's coming a day when Jesus will cry out and and God will have have a trumpet sounded and there'll be a, a, a voice and there'll be all of that stuff that will call us out of our graves, but... Up until now, nobody else has had an angel come and roll the stone away from their grave or dig up the dirt that's over them or, or bring back their ashes from the four corners of the earth and them have a resurrection like that. There have been people that came back from the dead, but it wasn't three days later. 
I love hearing the story of Smith Wigglesworth and how he was away and he got home and they told him that his wife had just died a few hours earlier. Great man of faith, one of God's generals, if you will. And he went in and he knelt over her and he prayed, God, give her back to me. And he called her name and he told her to come back and she came back to life. She might have been dead an hour or two, who knows. But you know what she said to him? What are you doing? I'm paraphrasing now. What are you doing? Why did you call me back? Well, I love you. I miss you. Yeah, but it was so much better there. He said, I'm sorry. I'll see you soon. And she went right back to heaven. Things like that are unusual for us because we don't experience that all the time. God help us, though, to have the kind of prayer life to where we could raise the dead. But here's what I'm trying to get at. Three days? Three days later? Only Jesus. You know, there is a tradition in the Jewish faith that sometimes the spirit lingers around the body for just under three days before it finally goes to be with God. Just a Jewish tradition. I don't think it's true. But Jesus had to get to that third day just to show he was really dead. But then he wasn't. What's miraculous about Jesus' resurrection? I'm going to skip forward just a little bit here. What's miraculous about his resurrection? Jesus fulfilled multiple prophecies concerning his death. So many prophecies that talked about how he would die, the mode by which he would die, the, the fashion, the, the tools, the beating that he would take, his visage being marred, which means his appearance would be marred. Everything about that happened according to prophecy. No one else had as many prophecies about his death and resurrection as Jesus did. Nobody had many prophecies at all about their resurrection, but some of them did have some about their death. Jesus suffered unimaginable torture before his death. His death was undeniable medically and scientifically. Jesus died. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus died. He died once and he rose again and he never died again. Think about it for a second. After he rose again, he didn't die a regular death at, say, 50, 60, 70 years old. He ascended back to the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you and me until he comes. That's a miraculous resurrection. That is a miraculous new life. Jesus' death undeniable. He died. We don't believe in the swoon theory. We don't believe that somebody stole his body and put a body double in his place. We don't believe any of that craziness. What we do believe is that we have a Savior that is able to do more than we ever imagined. We have a Savior that went to hell and took the keys to death and hell, and he said, you've had them long enough. Now it's me. I'm coming again, and anyone who will believe in me, I will raise them from the dead and take them to be with me forevermore. Not only was his resurrection undeniable, not only was his resurrection miraculous, but the resurrection that he gave us is miraculous as well because we were all dead in our trespasses and sin. We were all destined for hell. There was none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Anybody feeling me right here? Anybody else a sinner before God saved you? Anybody else a sinner still? Don't, don't, don't raise your hand if you're uncomfortable. But I want you to understand something, that if you're living in sin today, Jesus came not only for those of us who are getting all excited and acting like lunatics, he came for you so that you might have eternal life, forgiveness of sins. You'll be washed by his blood and made clean, and he'll write your name in his book, and he'll see you in heaven one day. Jesus lay in a tomb for the better part of three days. Jesus won the victory over the enemy of our souls in the belly of the earth during that time. Jesus showed his authority over political power when the guards sent by the government fell like dead men and left the tomb unguarded. He showed that he had power over a political authority. Okay, I'm not getting into a political discussion here. Hold on just a minute. 
but I'm not celebrating Transgender Visibility Day today. I'm celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He is why we're here today. He is why we live and move and have our breathing. He is the reason for our salvation. Why would I celebrate anything else? Political power has no power over Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he showed that when the guards fell as dead men and then left the tomb unguarded. Jesus showed his authority over religion. Well, I thought we liked religion, Pastor. I thought we were a religion. We're a movement. We're a church. We are the ecclesia. A religion can be a group that that gathers around the teachings of a man. But the church is a group that is called out from all of that to gather around their Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. We are different than the other religions of the world that serve dead gods. We're different than the rest of the religions of the world, the cults of the world that say they have a better way because they feel like it's a better way. What we have here is a group that stands for the truth of this beautiful word of God and a group that stands for the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ and the fact that he went back to heaven and one day he'll call us to be with him forevermore. So he showed his authority over political power. He showed his authority over religious power when the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Some of you might say, how can that be right? Why would God rip that that veil from top to bottom? Didn't he tell them how to build that temple? Yes, he did. But he also knew that one day there would be no need for lambs and bulls and goats and turtle doves. There would be no more need for an animal sacrifice to forgive our sins. But instead, Jesus would walk into the proverbial heavenly holy of holies and put his blood on the mercy seat. And then anybody who needed salvation, forgiveness, deliverance, healing, or any other thing would be able to proclaim and to claim the blessings of the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the miracle of the resurrection. Not quite done. Jesus overwhelmed death. He he walked out of the grave on his own power. Jesus showed Satan who is boss. He brought souls out of the grave with him as a type or shadow of the rapture. But the greatest miracle of the resurrection, the greatest miracle of all is that Jesus endured this pain. He endured this shame, which he did not deserve. He did all that for you and me. That's the miracle. Let me read you just a couple of scriptures before I make an appeal here. John 3, 16, we all know it. You can say it with me if you like. Read it off the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That means anybody. Romans 5 reads like this. For when we were still without strength, he's talking about the strength to be saved. When we were still without strength, when we still were not able to save ourselves, when we were still unable to live out the full law that was set before the Jews, when we were still unable to do everything right, when we still didn't have the strength to be holy in our own doing, when we were still without strength in due time. I like that. In due time. I don't know why God created the earth And allowed Adam and Eve to sin. It wasn't his will. It wasn't his purpose. But they did it. I don't know why. The earth got so evil. That God had to destroy it with a flood. And just save Noah. Shem, Ham and Japheth. And all their wives and kids. And a whole bunch of stinky animals. I don't know why he had to do that. I don't know. I'm thinking just kill them all. But he did. He sent the flood and he killed them. I don't know why. The Jews had to offer animal sacrifices. I don't know why Moses got 
kicked out of the prom or kept out of the promised land and it could only see it from Mount Nebo. By the way, it's a great view. I don't know why all that happened. I don't know why Jesus couldn't have just come in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, hey, I'm going to die because you sinned, but I'm going to live again. Wouldn't that have been amazing? Adam and Eve would have been impacted for the rest of their days. Instead, God just walked with them in the cool of the evening, and he killed an animal, and he gave them fur to wear. I wonder what Peter would think about that. The rest of you will get it tomorrow. In due time. God knew the exact moment that would be the best for Jesus to come, fulfill all the multiple prophecies, live, die, and rise again for us. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I love how he goes on to talk about it, Paul does here, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. A lot of you, if a really great person in your life, somebody really wonderful came along And they were going to die, and they told you, if you die, they'll live. You'd be like, you know, I like them and all, but I don't know. i got to die? But Jesus did that for you and me. He did that exact thing for you and me. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. It's a long shot, but it could happen. But God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. You know, I meet people all the time that say, you know, when I get my life straightened out, I'll come to church and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be saved. I'm like, you got it so backward. Just that very statement alone, the devil's going to jump all over that and he's going to say to you, ha ha, I got you now. You're never going to get it right. I'm going to make sure of it. But here's the thing. You can be jacked up, you can be addicted, you can be sick, you can be bound, you could have a demon right now. You could be possessed by a demon sitting in here, and every time I say the name Jesus, you feel a cringe inside. You can still be saved. There is no demon strong enough to withstand the power of the name of Jesus. He demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll come back to this verse. I just want you to understand something today. Jesus didn't go through all he went through and have a miraculous resurrection just so he could claim he had the keys to death and hell. He took them. There's no question about that. He didn't just come and live and die and rise again so that he could say he was the the big kahuna, the top dog, the alpha male. No. No. If he was going to do that, he would have called a press conference at the tomb and announced to everybody that he rose from the dead. Instead, he uh, came to one of the least of his kingdom, a formerly demon-possessed prostitute named Mary. And he called her by name, and she recognized it was him, and she was just moved by the fact that the Savior chose to speak to her in the garden after his resurrection. Peter and John, overwhelmed by the presence of God. Thomas, who doubted. You know, we all give Thomas a bad rap, but most of us would have probably acted just like Thomas. He ain't alive. Are you kidding me? I saw him die. I saw that water and blood flow. There ain't no way that guy's alive. And then Jesus came in and said, Thomas, come here, buddy. You said you had to put your fingers in the nail prints. And you said you had to put your hand in my side. He lifted up his robe right there and said, hey, here it is. Come on. (laughs) And it said that Thomas just fell on his face before Jesus. And maybe you're a little reluctant today. Maybe you feel like this is too much to believe. How am I supposed to believe that a guy that went through that kind of death is actually alive today and at the right hand of the Father? Because his word tells us so. 
History tells us so. Tradition tells us so. And I got to tell you right now, my experience tells me so. Because once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. I don't know why he died and saved such a worm as I, as the hymn says. But I know he did. Because ever since the day he saved me, everything's changed. Everything's different. I had a miraculous resurrection. <coughs> I'm about to tell my age here, but you probably already know it anyway. But in April of 1968, when I was six years old, being black, a man I've respected my whole life because he preached the night I got saved, evangelist preached the night I got saved on are you willing to stand up for Jesus? And I felt the call of God upon my heart to come and kneel down and pray and ask God to forgive me of my sins. I hadn't sinned a lot. I was only six. But I knew there was a change. And I said, Jesus, I want you to forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. And I've not been perfect ever since. Would never claim to be because that would be a lie. But Jesus loves me. Jesus helps me. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. If you're saved, you know how he's helped you. You know how he's loved you and when you were unlovable. I've been times since I've been saved, I was probably unlovable. I'm just thankful that my wife and my Lord both still love me sometimes. But if you're here today and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you're not saved, you're not forgiven, you've not walked walked into a relationship with Jesus, because that's what it is. It's not just an act, a one-time act. Go to the altar, pray, shake the preacher's hand, you're good to go till Jesus comes. No, it begins a relationship with Jesus, and his Holy Spirit walks with you. His presence walks with you, and he can deliver you, and he can heal you, and he can set you free. So I'm asking you today, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, would you give this concept, would you give this idea a moment to reach into your mind and to drop into your heart? But you know what? It's so much more than a thought or a concept. He's a person. And he wants to have a relationship with you that will change your life for the better. If you're here today, some of you maybe had a drug problem. Your family drug you to church today. It's all right. It's all right if they did. Some of you are probably thinking, if that preacher would ever be quiet, I can get out of here. I'm holding out. But there are a few of you here today that I know that the Holy Spirit has been, been talking to you. Jesus has been talking to you today. And he's saying to you, I've got a better way. I've got a better way. If that's you, and you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, would you do me the grand favor and honor of just standing up where you are? Right where you are, just stand up. I want to know Jesus, Pastor. I want to be saved today. This great Jesus and this miraculous revelation, resurrection, I want to be a part of that guy's life. Is there anybody today that would say, I need that, Pastor. I need salvation. I need to know that Jesus you're talking about. He loves you so much. He died a horrid, cruel death to give you salvation. Is there anybody here today that would say, Pastor, I need to know Jesus. I didn't come here for this. I wasn't planning on any of this. But something's gotten a hold of me. Listen, I know some of you are here. When I prayed about this service, I, I, I almost saw numbers of people that would not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Don't worry. God hasn't told me to come get any of you. That's not going to happen today. The Bible says that if you're going to be saved, you need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm telling you, he did. He did. Is there anybody today 
would say, I want to know that Jesus. It's the most important decision you'll ever make to accept that call. Anyone today that would say, yes, pastor, I need Jesus. I'm going to wait on you. We're going to sing this chorus through just one time. Feel free to stand and come. I'd love to pray with you today. Oh, how he loved you and me. that you would touch the heart and life of every individual here that is lost, that does not know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, God, in the week to come that you would speak to their hearts, that you would reach down to where they are and help them to understand the truth of what they heard today. Jesus died for our sins. He rose again in power, and he longs to have relationship with us. Let them know that. And God, then help them find a way to reach out to us or to somebody that knows Jesus and accept you as their Lord and Savior. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Can you give God praise one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk about just a couple of things real quick. One being, if you read the 90 days through the New Testament with us, we finished up, I think, yesterday. Wow. Uh, if you did that, thank you. Why don't you give yourselves a hand? Uh, next Sunday is going to be a really special day. We're having baptism at the conclusion of service. Uh, I hope that all of you that have been saved this year will call the office this week, talk to Miss Nancy, and let her know you want to be baptized so we can prepare adequately for you. Uh, if you've been saved any time in the last little while, you need to be baptized. The Bible says be saved and be baptized so it's the sign to the world that you're declaring your salvation so if you want to be baptized or if you got saved a long time ago and you haven't ever been baptized even if you want to do your first works over we'd love to baptize you next sunday morning at the conclusion of service we do have a very special guest next sunday dr thomas probes the international director of world missions for our denomination is going to be here he's going to tell us about the water project of all things, water project, water baptism, it kind of fits, doesn't it? And, and I'm also going to have another friend just drop in to say hi, Dole Scott, the overseer of Minnesota. Uh, I preached his camp, one of his nights of his camp meeting last year, going back this year for one night, and he just wanted to stop by and thank us. You may not know it, but we contributed to help them have their camp meeting last year. And if it hadn't been for us, it may not have happened. So he's just going to come by to say thank you next Sunday. I believe God has some special things in store for us. The following Sunday will be Membership Sunday. If you want to join the church, you can do that. Just call the office and ask Miss Nancy for some information. She'll get you on the right track to be ready to be a member of the church. Next Sunday night is our uh, prayer service, monthly prayer service. We have child and baby dedication on the 21st. If you have a, a child you've had in the last little while and they've not been dedicated, uh, feel free to also contact us. We'll need to get name and pictures and all that kind of stuff so we can celebrate your family on that day. And then after church that day, we're going to have a big family day event down outside of Harvest House. We're going to put up some tents for those of you that don't like the sun. We're going to cook hamburgers and hot dogs. We might even have a couple of dessert uh, food trucks around. If you want to gorge on some kind of sugar-baked fried stuff, you can do that as well. 
I like that stuff. So, I, 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 and and we're gonna have enough for everybody. So plan to stay. We're gonna you can change after church. You can dress casual that Sunday. Whatever works for you. Uh, but let's plan to come and have a great time together. It's gonna be like an outdoor, less official homecoming that day. So we're gonna have a great time, and I hope to see all of you there. Um, what am I forgetting? Anything? Don't think so. Thank you for being with us today. Look at look around. Isn't this a beautiful homecoming crowd here today? I'm so thankful you're here. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you joined us by uh, online, if you joined us by live stream, thank you for being with us as well. Again, remember, if you're fairly new or you haven't been here in a while, we'd love to see you in the connect room right there with Pastor Cody waving at me. Uh, have a wonderful Easter afternoon, and everywhere you go, tell everybody, Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus took out. <laughs> Jesus.